Well, uh, welcome to uh, this symposium. My name is Ping Xu. I'm the interim dean of the college. And today is my honor to introduce to you our speakers. And I must apologize that uh, I, I didn't expect that we have a second speaker. So all my information is only for the first speaker. So my, our uh, second speaker, so our first speaker, will introduce our second speaker. So uh, today we have uh, two speakers. Uh, Lenao Shokra, and the second speaker, Manahar Bhatharni. Bhatharni? Sorry. And so, as I said, I will just introduce the, 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 the background information about the first speaker. Uh, Mr. Shokra is Vice President of Industry and Internet of Things Cloud Solution at Oracle. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Shokran received his Bachelor's of Engineering degree in Advanced Computing Science and Mathematics from a very prestigious university, French university, uh, Equal Dimin. His Master of Engineering degree from McGill University and his MBA from UC Berkeley's Haas School of Business. He joined the Oracle in 2015 as its Vice President of in Industry and IoT. Before joining Oracle, Mr. Shokran worked for Cisco for 10 years in two executive positions. The first one is the Senior Director of Strategy, Planning, and Operations. The second position is Vice President and General Managers, where he co-launched, uh, productized, and scaled Cisco's Internet of Things business. He joined Oracle last year as its Vice President of Industry and IoT. So let's welcome Mr. Shokram and Mr. Benhari. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, the invitation and for the introduction. Let me um, introduce my colleague, uh, Manoha Bambani. Manoha is uh, a graduate from uh, Bombay University in Computer Science, uh, worked for years in consulting at uh, Tata Consulting Services in the US consulting for companies like G Aviation and other companies, then joined Oracle 18 years ago. 18 years ago is a long time. Uh, he's seen Oracle grow from a 20,000 people company to 140,000 people company today. So he's been uh, clearly around uh, technology and software for a long time. At Oracle, he was uh, doing uh, consulting at customers. He's been working on specific uh, computer uh, engineering uh, work around ERP system and so forth. And over the past roughly 10 years, he's been part of a team which we call uh, Industry Solution Group. So what we do uh, as a living is we take all the technology from Oracle today in the cloud, we look at the technology from third party partners and we build solutions. So we go at, look at all the industries, manufacturing, transportation, cities, retail, and so forth, and we look how do we enable a digital transformation for these industries using cloud as a technology to be able to enable our solutions. So that's what Manu does today. He's the VP of engineering of our team, and he'll uh, uh, join me in a second, um, in a few minutes, to uh, show you a live demo of what we are doing at Oracle today. So before I get started, um, uh, what we're going to focus today is on Internet of Things, IoT, and I'm assuming all of you know what IoT is about. I mean, it's about connecting objects, whatever object you can think of. Objects are being connected to the millions, to the billions today. I mean, actually, IDC, which is a major uh, analyst company, is expecting that over 2 billion devices will be connected by 2020. 2 billion devices, and we're not talking about cell phones. Cell phones are mini computers. It's pretty easy. We're talking about any kind of small device you can think of. You know, if you are, uh, if you have asthma and you have a puff, some of you may have. My daughter has asthma. Now, when you puff and you get the medication because you are having a a crisis, not only you get the medication to take care of yourself, but you also analyze the air at the time you puff through a chip, through a communication uh, device embedded into your medical. Um, uh, device, and you can correlate all the information of all the people using medical devices at the same time across the country. So you can now understand the weather and how the pollution and how 
um, you know, whatever is happening, you can understand how to predict a crisis. P perhaps around chi Chicago over the next two days, doctors are predicting that the combination of different factors are going to make it difficult for people with asthma. So we can't connect anything today. Uh, the change before was the cost of communication. Cost of communication has gone down significantly. We can connect on 3G, 4G, but we have so many other ways of communicating to a device in a very, very cheap way. I mean, there's now technology that's going to come to the market where you pay a buck a month to connect a device. For a buck a month to connect a device, you have a lot of opportunity to uh, bring information and make decisions. And that's what I want to talk about today. There are two kinds of Internet of Things. There's the consumer IoT and the industrial IoT. Consumer IoT is your Fitbits. You know, you all maybe run, do sport, whatever it is. We are all bombarded by these new devices that you can carry with you. You have Nest, which is a company that Google acquired for a lot of money uh, about two or three years ago, which is now connecting your uh, smoke detector, connecting your heater and all those. This is a consumer IoT. All of us benefit from it. New innovation comes all the time from these small companies and startups providing... Uh, you know, new ways to optimize your life to, to some extent. And you have the industrial IoT, which is where we focus on. Most of the big high-tech companies actually don't focus on the consumer IoT. Consumer IoT is a very, very exciting time, but there's not a huge adoption yet. Uh, and the benefits have to be, you know, explained, and it's not always clear that it's not a, a trend versus a real benefit. In industrial IoT, what we do to optimize the way people move in a city, what we do to optimize the way you consume energy, what we do to optimize the way you shop in a store by using sensors and be able to really detect that you are the person coming in the store and we know your profile so we can now help you get a personalized discount the day, the second you step in the store. That's the kind of business we're going to talk about. So no consumer IoT today in discussion. Happy to take questions at the end of... Uh, of the session, but I uh, will focus on the industrial intent of things. So when we look at how the world is uh, changing, there are you know, four big trends. The first one is things that we all use in industries used to be bracking. We would get someone make a phone call to fix it and move on again, but the operations would stop. We're well, moving from bracking and fixing on schedule to predicting what's happening. We know we have enough information through our big data capabilities now across all industries to be able to collect information and predict the operations. We move away from owning a device to using a device as a service. If you go to your hospital tomorrow and you need to get a scanner, in 90% of the cases, the doctor is doing the scanner to you has never paid for the machine. The machine is actually belonging to GE belonging to Philips, belonging to Siemens. Siemens is um, selling the machine as a service. Every time they click on a button, like you do it on a printer, but it, in that case, it's a scanner for your body, the doctor is going to pay for it. More and more so, customers don't want to uh, take cash and buy uh, equipment, and equipment is going to get all over time. They basically want to get an equipment as a service. They are going to pay a subscription, like you pay for Netflix, like you pay for you know, uh, Spotify. You are going to sit over and over in the industry moving forward. Uh, we move from, as we said, static analytics to real-time analytics. In the past, I used to batch information for a day, for a week, for 10 days. And I like look at your energy uh, consumption, electricity consumption. In the past, you would have someone come to your house and look at the electric meters and come back a month, two months, a quarter later to basically understand how much you consumed. That was batching information. Now we have uh, electric meters in San Francisco in, in the full Bay Area. pg and &E has connected everything. Every 15 minutes, they bring information back. Not just to bill you, not just to make you pay for the consumption you have, but also because the information they get is informing them on how stable the electric, electric, uh, utility grid is today at any point of time. So now we can real-time analyze the information and do proactive analytics. And now we are moving from central services. If I, um, it, it used to be like, um, I would need to call someone to take care of my machine, take care of my tractor, take care of my car. 
but more and more so because we are able to detect, um, as you drive your car now, the GM um, manufacturing company is going to be able to know at any point of time how your car is functioning. They'll be able to tell you, you know, uh, we are starting to detect a default in your car before it fails. They are able to even uh, pre-schedule an oil change for you to make it easy for you because they are detecting that without having seen you, without having seen the, 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 the state of the car. So now we are moving from central service kind of model to everybody has the ability to um, be self-guided and self-serve. So because this is changing and because we are able to connect all the devices from a very, very, very tiny device. Now you have cheap technology. I can put, uh, imagine there's only one bulb in this, in this room, and I put a chip below that table. Everything else is dark. There's enough power in the bulb to power my chip through uh, the new technology that uh, you know, the internet of the world are putting in the market today. So you don't even have to power the chips anymore. Just not, you just need to have a tiny, tiny measure of light, even artificial light, for a piece of the day for your chip to be able to communicate. So because we know how to do that very easily, because the cost of communication is going down, we can bring the information back to an IoT platform, which we'll um, talk to you about, and, and enable some IoT applications. So when we talk about IoT applications, I'll cover four today as an example. Asset monitoring, product, production monitoring, fleet monitoring, and connected worker. Asset monitoring is you know, what we discussed about already. Be able to detect where an asset is, what's the health of that asset in the field, and get a lot of information about location, about usage, about um, um, how it's functioning in the field, operating in the field or not. Production monitoring, this is very critical. You have a lot of manufacturing facilities around the world, in the US, in Asia, in Europe, and so forth. If you are able to know at any point of time how your operations are working and be able to detect ahead of time potential quality deficiencies on your product, you are ahead of the curve. You don't have to have the product coming out. You don't have to have the Samsung Note 7 issue uh, on manufacturing your battery and getting a recall of several billion dollars because you can basically monitor your operations in a much more um, tight way. Fleet monitoring. So it's not only us driving, which is uh, monitoring how we drive, but you, know, you also want to monitor how uh, truck drivers uh, drive, how bus drivers drive. And beyond that, you also want now with your insurance company, I don't know if you, you guys have a car yet, but very likely in 10 years, you'll never pay insurance the way I paid insurance for the past 20 years. You'll pay insurance based on usage. You don't use your car for a day, you don't pay for insurance. But you'll pay insurance based on how you behave driving. If you start speeding, if you start braking like crazily, if you start behaving not the way you should behave on the road, you'll be penalized on your insurance. Is it fair? Is it not fair? It doesn't matter. The technology does that today. Insurance companies don't want to have insurance customers who are not following the rules of, of driving. So whether we like it or not, your car is being connected. Your Tesla will be connected and the car that will follow on the Tesla, which will cost probably 10,000 bucks in 10 years, Electric will be fully connected. So we are connecting that to be able to deliver new services, but also give you a pretty hefty discount on your insurance. If you go to Progressive today, which is an insurance company, you can get up to 40% discount on your monthly bill if you've followed uh, the, um, uh, the speed limit and so forth. And they know what it is because at any point of time, they know what GPS location. It's an opt-in today. You have to opt-in to get that kind of benefit. In 10 years, I'm ready to bet. It's not an opt-in anymore. It's going to be mandatory for everybody. And then the last one is connected worker. So it's not the point is not to connect a worker for the sake of spying on a worker, but you have industries where you really want to know what your workers are doing and how healthy they are. If you take mining, I went to uh, a mining um, uh, site in northern Canada. They are open 24-7. Northern Canada, they operate at minus 25 degrees Celsius. Minus 25 degrees Celsius, trust me, you don't want to be sick when you're out there in the blizzard. So they connect the walkers, they are monitoring their health, they are understanding if someone is not moving, they want to understand if that person stopped or tripped or fell because the person sort of doesn't feel well. You have five minutes to get a track to that person. So all these industries where you have 
mining, construction, you have some kind of safety component connected to it, connecting a worker has a benefit. Actually, uh, interestingly, in hospital, they uncovered that nurses uh, walk up to eight kilometers a day to find the medical equipment they need. You know, when you go in an emergency room, they don't have all the equipment for every room. It would be too expensive. So they share equipment. You know, they are rolling on their uh, small um, base. And so if you don't have the equipment you need at any point of time, you have to search for it in the, the hospital. Eight kilometers a day of non-productive time for your patients, probably tiring the nurses because it's a long distance to do, for nothing else but trying to find the asset in the field. So if you can connect that and connect your nurse to be able to tell you at any point of time, you know, I'm on second floor, I'm looking for that whatever scanner machine, mobile scanner machine, there's one on the first floor available now and you can go and get it in two minutes versus trying to chase it in the hospital. That's the kind of benefit you get to the nurse as a walker, you get to the hospital in terms of productivity, but you get to the patient who has to be taken care of, it doesn't have to wait for hours and hours to be taken care of. So these are the kind of applications um, we at Oracle provide. And, and today I'm not going to uh, focus specifically on what we do at Oracle. We'll show you a demo in terms of the capabilities, but it, the point is to explain to you where the industry is going. And what you see are very easy uh, cloud solutions that the market is consuming today. Um, so uh, I think I covered them uh, pretty quickly already, but. Uh, one of the few things on asset monitoring is location tracking. Again, you want to be able to have a geolocation of your assets to understand you know, if they stay within the zone of operations that you are looking for. And you want to be able to know at any point of time how your asset is operating, is it healthy or not. And detect um, a failure ahead of time, we'll show you a demo uh, in a few minutes. Operations, we talked about that. What's very important in operations is not just is my 3D printer, you know, you know like in manufacturing facilities now, more and more so we are seeing the 3D printers, not the small mom and pop 3D printer that you and I can buy to play at home. They are huge machines, they are worth a million bucks. They are all digitalized, so you have a lot of sensors, and you need to be able to understand at any point of time how your machine is operating. If you see a fluctuation in temperature in your machine, does it mean you have to stop? The production, does it mean like the raw material you are using is not adapted to it? Does it mean the technician, sorry, who's working on the machine is not trained for that kind of operations? Does it mean the customer will be impacted on the quality of, of the product you are manufacturing? And if it's uh, an aerospace customer, you probably care a lot. If it's a toy customer, you probably will have a bit more flexibility. How do you bring all this knowledge together in the production line to be able to make the right decision at any point of time. We talked about fleet, um, but it's, you know, it's your FedEx, it's your UPS, but it's any kind of fleet management activities that you see. Actually, police cars are benefiting from that. Um, uh, now we're talking about ambulance. You know, of course, they have priority when they have an emergency, but would it be nice if you could see at any point of time the lights, green uh, traffic lights being synchronized based on the location of your ambulance. This is around the corner. This is not 20 years uh, uh, away from today that we're going to be uh, doing that. There are pilots in the world today, in Asia spe specifically, where the emergency forces, firemen, uh, fire um, trucks, uh, police and ambulances, have priority over traffic like we have today because they make a lot of noise, but the traffic is being aligned to make sure they can go even faster. So that's the way we do it in terms of uh, connecting the fleet, and as I said, um, being able to look at connected workers in um, hotels, mining, engineering, construction, you know, hospitals, and so forth. So why does it matter for a company like Oracle, but why does it matter for a company like Microsoft and Google and um, IBM and SAP and uh, Salesforce, and I can go on, and Cisco and so forth. I can go on and on and on because there's a market transition that's happening. The way we've been um, communicating to devices is revolutionized now. I mean, for many of you, uh, you've been born using a cell phone, using a connected device. So it sounds like very trivial, but trust me, these industries have done operating on the utility grid for 100 years 
they never had visibility on what was happening on the grid. When the only way they knew that there was a, a fault on the grid somewhere was because you were making a phone call, I was making a phone call, and they were triangulating phone calls to be able to say, oh, these five people live in the same area and made me a phone call to tell me that something is fishy. The grid is down. I don't know what's happening. Now they are connecting everything down to the meter at the home to be able to connect everything. The market for, for, a, company, sorry, for a company like Oracle, we don't do connectivity and hardware. A um, company like Cisco does. A company like Intel do, uh, uh, do that. We are not uh, a system integrator kind of company. So you see the, the big um, services companies like Accenture and Deloitte and IBM and Tata Consulting and Wipro and others are all investing millions in being able to deliver the services. The piece that we care about in our job day to day on the computer science side, on the software side, is really the infrastructure, software infrastructure and the software application. In the cloud terms, it's the platform as a service and the software as a service, which are the two layers of um, computer science of software that people, customers are consuming as a service today. And it's a huge market, you know, 22, 45 billion. It doesn't matter the number. It's over 10 billion. It's big enough for anybody to care about and it's big enough for the customers to care about. When you think of it in terms of industries, if you look at the top you know, uh, industries that we're looking at, we're talking about $200 billion opportunity. And again, it's not like um, the return investment on these opportunities are significant. Customers actually get return investment in less than a, a year, usually, on equipment that has, that's going to be lasting 20, 30 years uh, in the field, which is absolutely significant. So we care, but everybody cares today. Um, I heard from your doctor professor that uh, there's a demand in the school about getting more um, curriculum around IoT. Guess what? I mean, there are lots of companies that are looking at the market investing today. You see, you know, the big names of Silicon Valley companies, you'll see a lot of companies that are small startups, medium-sized medium companies, or I would say just industrial companies where in the past you would see them as being a hardware company like GE. I mean, GE, 10 years ago, everybody would think of GE as building, uh, you know, medical devices or utility devices, energy devices, whatever it is, big machines, big uh, wind turbine, whatever it is. Now GE is... Uh, G in San Ramon created an IoT center uh, five years ago. They started with two people. They are 15,000 people today. San Ramon is the Silicon Valley, just on the other side of, uh, uh, of the barrier from Palo Alto. 15,000 people in the company continues to invest in that space. So all these companies are in the market heavily investing, but it's getting even worse every day. Worst in a good way. This is basically where what you see in market, where you see the volume of investment be coming from VCs and investment bankers and big high-tech companies like Oracle of the world. It means there's a real market behind that. It's not just vapor or, or um, um, uh, a fake market or hype. It's, it's a real benefit for, for the world and real benefit for the industries and real benefit for the consumers. But the market cannot continue this way. It's way too fragmented for the time being. You'll see a lot of concentration. You'll see companies in the Bay Area and everywhere in the world acquiring companies every day. You'll see acquisitions happening because the big industrial players, the GE, the Itachi, the Fujitsu, the Toshiba, the Siemens, and on and on and on, I have to play in that space. That's the future of their, of their industry. If they don't play in that space, they are going to be basically um, just a, 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 a manufacturing company of devices. They don't want to be a manufacturing company of devices. They want to touch on the data. They want to deliver analytics to be able to deliver a better value. So when you think of IoT, um, you have different ways to segment the market. Uh, one of the ways we look at is around these six buckets, you know, uh, industrial automation, we talked about it, but it's also touching the city side uh, the smart city component. How do you optimize parking in a city? How do you optimize waste management? How do you optimize um, lighting in a city? Everything is being connected also. You see healthcare, we talked about healthcare, but you also, it's not just you going to the hospital where there's a benefit in optimizing the, 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 the production, but it's also uh, 
um, innovating on medication. Medication before you needed to have um, trial testing of medication. So I would be volunteer. I would go to see the pharmaceutical company that would give me some medication. It could be uh, a true medication or fake medication. And then every week I would just note on a paper, I'm feeling dizzy, I have a headache. Uh, I feel like uh, this, this is not the secondary effect of what I'm taking every day. It happens to me that they want to have the information right now. They want to know when you take the medication now, they have actually an organic chip that tells them at the time you take the medication and you ingest it, it goes through your body, it connects to your phone one last beep to tell the pharmaceutical company that you injected the medication, and it's starting to measure, because you'll put a few devices that they give you, to measure your metabolism for the next one hour so that they know exactly what's happening. They don't want to be told based on what you write on a piece of paper. They want to be able to measure your uh, ingestion of medication so that when it's being released in the market, when it's authorized to be a medication, and all of us use it for whatever reason, they really understand the secondary effects. So the healthcare industry is using that. Energy management, all over the places. Uh, but of course, uh, UTT, as I said, uh, are investing in what is called the smart grid. That's a term that's been coined about 15 years ago. Uh, it's basically enabling IoT application on the grid to be able to be better root energy, better stabilize the grid. And they have no choice to do that, by the way. It's not just they want to do it to make it easier for them. If you go to Germany, about 20% of the grid, you may know Germany decided to move away from nuclear uh, generation. So while France, I'm French as you can tell, continues to have nuclear uh, energy generation, Germany decided to move away from it. Uh, following up on the um, uh, situation in Japan about six, seven years ago now, uh, Germany decided they don't want to have any kind of risk. They moved away from, uh, from nuclear uh, generation and it's going to take them 10 years. They are replacing it with uh, renew renewable energy. Renewable energy is beautiful, everybody loves it, but it's not productive. You don't know when the sun is going to shine. You don't know when the wind is going to blow. You don't know any of that. So you have to always be in a position of predicting what's happening. And when you get to up to 15% of your energy in a country that's coming from renewable energy, your grid is becoming unstable. Unstable means what? means like tomorrow morning you'll be in Germany and plug something on your, on your wall because you expect your computer to be charged, because you expect your phone to be charged. And guess what? It may not, it may not work anymore. And it's unbelievable to think that in Germany it may not work anymore, but unless they connect the full grid, unless they instrument every device that's generating energy and be able to do prediction, they'll be in a position where German citizens won't be able to be uh, living in the rela reliable energy consumption, which of course you know, people don't want because they have expectations now. So very critical for energy management. Automotive and telematics, we talk about fleet management, we talk about um, um, traffic management, connecting your car, all the Google and Apple and Tesla cars of the world are fully connected. The Tesla, whether, I'm, I'm, I'm sure nobody has a Tesla here. I mean, if you have a Tesla, just give it to me, I'll use it for the weekend. But, uh, but the Tesla is being connected 24 seven, whether you like it or not, they bring gigabyte of information uh, uh, that they use to optimize the, the production of the next car, but they're also used to be able to give you services today. Environmental monitoring, pollution is a big issue. Um, in many countries now, they are connecting, uh, <laughs> they have uh, G, is a very interesting, G has a, a lighting pole that you see now. All the lighting poles are LED lighting, and on top of it, they connect a new kind of sensors, so they basically measure uh, sound, noise, they measure pollution, they measure everything to be able to give you a better environment, uh, whether it's uh, for um, uh, water condition or water um, safety, it's noise level, whatever it is, everything is now being measured and the cities are looking into that. And then there's the infrastructure management, which are the uh, train station, the airports and so forth. Uh, we are actually working on a solution, I'd love to know if if you believe it would be valuable to, be, to you, but let's say you go and have to take a plane and you are late, you know, happens to me, and you get to the security line and you have an, an hour security line and your plane is leaving in 45 minutes. The security line has no 
uh, is not going to give you a favor in most cases. You know, you should be planning for that. What about if we could detect that you came to the airport, um, we know what your plane is, we see we are measuring every operations in the airplane, so we know how long it would take to you from, from you to get through the security line, through the custom, through maybe going to a different terminal, and we know you are going to very likely miss your plane. What about if you could be offered on your phone automatically say, uh, customer, uh, and you are at risk of missing your plane, are you interested in going through a priority line? And just do it in a personalized way. We can do all of that today by just having you opt in on your cell phone to get services like that to be able to optimize the operations of the airport. The airport loves it because they want you to have a good memory of, oh, I fly from SFO and I never miss my plane because they take care of me. The airline companies love it because they don't want to wait for you and call your name for 20 minutes because you are not in a plane and your luggage is in a plane. And you love it because you don't miss your plane. And we optimize the service based on that. That's what we are doing in the infrastructure management today. So moving along, I'll skip this one for a second. I'll just give you a few examples of what we're doing with our customers. Um, I'll take the bottom left, uh, Vinci. Vinci is a major European company managing, man, uh, managing infrastructure uh, um, buildings. So airports and train station and campuses. You know, like uh, many campuses in Europe are actually being built by Vinci and managed by Vinci so that the um, um, you know, energy and management of the campus and the uh, safety and opening the door, closing the door. So we are working with them on um, how do you optimize the building management operations across the different customers they have using uh, IoT. SoftBank, SoftBank is uh, releasing a new service in Japan in a pilot mode for the time being, but they are offering these electric uh, scooters um, that you can rent for five minutes, for 10 minutes, for an hour, like you do it for a bike, like you do it for a zip car, but they want to do it on an electric bike and do it in a minute fashion. So you can go take it, move it. If you go to France, you have uh, that kind of system for bikes, but they want to do it in Japan for electric scooters. And of course it has, because it's electric, it has a lot of uh, um, logistics and operations um, uh, challenges because you don't want to have your customers renting um, a, a bike for now to be running off energy. So they have to connect all these different pieces. So I'm working with them on a, on a project in Japan. Gemu, Gemu is, a, uh, is a company manufacturing valves. Those valves are being used in manufacturing very, very high precision valves. So when you build chemicals, when you build medication, you want to make sure your valve is giving you the right level of product at the right time, with the right quantity, with the right concentration, to be able to build the operations and make sure that the quality of the product is what it should be. So they are connecting all the valves now. The valves talk to each other. They are calling um, uh, on the uh, technician if things are not properly adjusted so that you never stop your operations and you optimize the end quality. And then we are working with um, um, an OEM dealership uh, car dealership, sorry, that is uh, wanting to not only... So the big question in the car is who's owning the relationship to the customers? As you can imagine, if you are Ford, if you are uh, a dealer, all, all they want is to be able to sell you a car, of course, but they also want to accompany you as you use the car for your life. They want to be able to take care of you if they see something is not going well in your car, so you don't go to the garage next door, but you are invited to come back to the dealership. They want to basically provide you self services that make you feel that that car dealership is not just selling you a car, but taking care of you as you, you know, use it for five, 10 years and you want to change your cars. They want to establish a relationship, a personal relationship. So they are integrating mobility and, and IT technology in the car now to be able to give you a lot of services you would never get for free in the past, but you get for free. Because the car dealership is betting on the fact that Next time you want to buy a car, you probably go to them because you, uh, um, you got the level of services to a new level. So what uh, we're going to do for the next 20, 25 minutes now is show you a demo because there's nothing else but to see it working live. The demo we're going to show you is a solution we call digital field service. What it means is like you have an asset in a field. In that case, we have a pump. We have a blue pump. Of course, we didn't bring a real pump. Uh, we cannot do that, way too heavy. But 
there are pumps all over the United States being used today. That pump is going to be monitored, but how do you correlate the information between how the pump is functioning, where it's located, what's the health of my pump, what service can I offer on the pump, if it's going um, in the direction of uh, faulting in the next 24 hours, you want to know it before it's faulting because then your operation is done. And how do you connect that to the field technician that's going to be called and take care of fixing that pump? All that cycle of connecting the field service component to IoT, to mobility analytics, is a solution that is applicable across industries. And services is a major component of most industries you, you look at. So the benefit you get are really in terms of uh, being able to keep up time of all the assets you have in the field, you are able to provide a new level of services, you are able to understand how your product is operating, so in terms of product quality, you have a, a, a feedback loop back to your engineering team to be able to say, look, you know, yes, it's working 90% of the time, but the 10% we have this kind of issue with the pump, you are able to provide information to your sales teams and increase your customer satisfaction. You can reduce the service cost, because if you can avoid a field technician to go in the field and go and take a truck and fix something, you are saving a lot of money for your company. Um, you want to um, minimize the failures, because at the end of the day, if I buy a pump from you, if I buy a pump from G, if I buy a pump, if I buy any equipment, if I buy an equipment from Cisco, if I buy uh, a lighting from Philips, whatever it is, I want that to be operating 24-7, that's why I'm buying it. That's why I'm buying it from a branding company. Um, you want to avoid failures. You want to be able to take an action. Would it be good if before your HVAC goes down at home, the company who sold you the HVAC says, you know what, we detected something not, not clean. We'll come ahead of time, do a service, um, cost, a service uh, uh, action on your HVAC ahead of time at no cost for you, customer. But at least we're sure that uh, for the coming summer that's going to be pretty, pretty hot in Texas, you'll have your HVAC uh, all time long. You are not going to be in a situation of not having HVAC for a few days. So that's what companies are doing. So that's what I wanted to show you. How do we bring mobility, IoT, service, and analytics together to deliver a new kind of service experience for the companies? And it's applicable across industries. It's not just... Uh, um, you know, manufacturing, it's true for water, electricity, gas, telecommunication, travel, it's true for the city, you know. Um, you want to be able to have always the right uh, level of services in the city. You want your parking lot to be functional. You want your lighting in the street for safety issues to be always on. How do you assure that unless you connect the devices and you have a service component associated to it? So I'll turn to Mano now. Mano is going to show you a live demo of uh, what we present to customers uh, every day and the kind of uh, uh, operations we can run. It's running live in the cloud, so there's no fake, there's no, uh, it's not a video, it's not a click-through um, um, presentation. It's a live demo that we show to customers um, every day and we have discussions on how to implement it uh, for our customers in their operations. Thank you, Lionel. So, fingers crossed, doors crossed, hopefully it works. So you saw this blue pump out here. You know, now, in reality, the pumps are going to be out on the field where you know, the, the field service managers who are sitting behind their offices won't have access to the actual pumps. right? But with IoT, we can have access to the data coming in from the pump. And we are able to, as Lionel said, predict even before an event occurs that an event is actually going to occur. So I have up on my screen a simulator. I can turn on my simulator. This is, you know, instead of a physical device, I actually have a simulator running. So the simulator, as you can see, is, is simulating the fact that a pump is working out on the field. It's sending its data on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, on, on the other side, actually, I have my iPad, um, which, which is connected. And, and here, you know, I am Lisa. Lisa is a field service manager who's responsible for managing all the assets out on the field. And Lisa comes in, wakes up in the morning, and comes in and sees a dashboard. She can see the health of her assets out there on the field as to what is going on. She can see from a location perspective where the assets are located. She can click on any particular location to see what is happening with a particular asset. 
Let's say, for example, I'm actually going to click on this particular pump, and I'm going to touch on this, this pump that we had. It's a centrifugal blue pump um, that you can see running. Now, Lisa is actually monitoring the health of that particular asset, and you can see in live streaming data coming in from the pump into Lisa's dashboard. So Lisa is not there physically, but she can see the data coming in from where the device is into her dashboard right there. Now, it's interesting because Lisa can also see at the same time the health of the pump, that the asset health is green, everything is okay. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually simulate an event of a failure. I'm gonna actually simulate the fact that, you know, the, the pump is gonna fail. Now, if I simulate a low severity event, I'm gonna say, okay, you know what? There is a small issue with the pump. I'm simulating that issue. You can see the bearing became slightly red in color. It means there's something going on with that bearing out there. Now, in a matter of a few minutes or a few seconds, you will see the asset health changing from green to amber, signifying the fact that there is an issue going on with that particular pump out there. Now, from a human eye perspective, the data that you are seeing streaming is not changing. It appears to be within range. You can see the gauges on the bottom of the on, on the bottom of the screen, the gauges show everything is green. So from a human eye perspective, everything is fine, not an issue. But the system has detected, based on the parameters that are there, based on the data streams that are coming in, that there is a probability of failure of that particular asset. And there is a 35% probability of failure. The real data that is coming in, every, every stream of data that is coming in, every value that is coming in, we are analyzing that in real time. That's why you can see the variation. It varies between 26 to 36 to 45. But the point is there is an issue. Now, what can Lisa do? Lisa can actually try to resolve the issue. You can go into the, you can go into the latest incidents to see if there are any incidents, and you can see that there is an erratic motor failure incident that has just shown up. It's an amber. So Lisa can see that there is an issue with this particular incident. Um, my, my motor is not behaving as well as it should. At the time of incident, there was a 47 probability of that motor failing in the next eight to 24 hours. Can I try and resolve this issue? In a normal circumstance, first of all, you would not be actually detecting the issue in a normal circumstances. But even if you were able to detect the issue, the normal situation would be, let me pick up the phone and dispatch Jeff, who's my technician, to go out and actually fix that particular asset. That's going to cost us a lot of money to go dispatch Jeff out there. So let me see if I can resolve it. I'm going to try and do what is called as an auto-resolve. Now, I'm Lisa. I don't know what to do. I'm going to say, you know, let's just go resolve it. You know, system, you figure it out and see if you want to resolve this particular issue. And, and what the diagnostic check decides that there is an issue with the motor frequency, we need to upgrade the software. That doesn't require the technician to go outside. So I can auto-resolve this issue uh, while I'm there. And on the right side, you will see what is happening is the pump is being turned off remotely. So you saw the pump stopped working out there. The software and the firmware was checked and is being upgraded. And once that upgrade happens, the pump is turned back on. Now, does that resolve the issue? We'll see it in a few seconds, and hopefully it should resolve the issue that has occurred. Now, it looks very simple on the face of it, but behind the scenes, if you think about it, there is so much involved. We have the device which is streaming its data into the IoT cloud service. That data is being analyzed in real time by an algorithm which decides and looks at the various parameters and the various values and data that has come in over hundreds of pumps over a period of time to make a determination if there is an issue that is gonna occur in the future. And if so, the other part of the program has detected that there is an actual intelligence that has gone in, we call it as the Oracle policy automation, that actually goes in and determines that there is a software or a firmware issue that I can actually upgrade remotely without actually dispatching a technician. And all that is happening behind the scenes. You saw a service request being created, but we did not dispatch a technician. So multiple moving components behind the scenes coming together in unison and making the fact that everything is okay with the pump. The pump has gone back to green. You saw in the live streaming, now obviously the live streaming is a little uh, you know, delayed by a few seconds, but you saw the fact that it stopped the pump, that's where the data went out, 
the stream is back up, the pump is up, everything is operational. Now, that was a simple, low severity issue. It's not, it's not as if it's a complicated issue, right? Now, let's go in and see what happens if a real severe issue happens, right? So I'm going to simulate what we call as a, a, a high severity pump failure. Now, when I simulate a high severity pump failure, you can see that the bearing has become bright red. It means there's something really going on with the bearing, right? Now, Lisa is actually monitoring this and seeing this while she is not at the site, right? And you so all of a sudden see that the asset health turned from green to amber to red. Now, this is the real-time predictive algorithm which is detecting. Now, do you see the range of the pump, the values? The range is still in the green for all these parameters that we are checking. We are checking the bearing temperature, the flow rate, the discharge pressure. It's still in the acceptable range individually, but a combination of all of that is causing the pump to fail. Now, a, a, an incident has been created. We can go back to the latest incidents, and the latest incident will show up out there that there is a severe issue. Now, can Lisa try and resolve this issue? She can potentially try and resolve this issue, but you know what? The guided dissolve is not going to help resolve this issue because the firmware is okay. We just upgraded a firmware. The firmware is all right. So what can we do? So we have something called as a guided resolve. You know? So what, what, what Lisa is going to do, pick up the phone and call the person out there who's near the pump and say, has the pump noise level increased? Do you see it you know, making a lot of noise? You say yes or no. Is the vibration increasing? Yes, the vibration has increased. Is the pump consuming more power? I don't know. I, I, how do I know whether it's consuming more power or not? Is the pump running too slow? Yeah, it looks like it's running too slow. So Lisa is answering these questions while talking to somebody who's close to the pump and hitting the submit button. The recommendation comes back that the viscosity of the lubricant has reduced and there is something, some issue with the bearing. Now, in a normal circumstance, what would you think? There's an issue with the bearing, the bearing has become red. What would be the first reaction? Reduce the pump operation, right? You reduce the frequency of the pump. But on the contrary, according to the service manuals that have been provided by the pump, reducing the pump frequency is going to cause the vibration to increase, cause your pump to fail almost immediately. So the solution and the recommendation is, let's go increase the pump frequency. Let's go push it so that it runs more. And what that is going to do, it's going to actually stabilize the pump. And that's going to buy us more time. So that, that's the recommendation that has come back. Let's go increase it by 25%. Can we try that? So we go ahead and try that. And what happens is the recommendation is, is accepted. And the pump is actually getting better. And uh, it should change from red to amber. But I'll just show you on the simulator. You will see it's become from a bright red to a light red, which means that I have enough time right now to dispatch my technician to go and resolve that particular issue. You can see that it's become amber. Has it completely resolved the issue? No, it's not. But it is time for me to dispatch a technician. I have enough time to make sure that my technician can go on site and resolve that particular issue. So what do I do? I'm going to actually create a work order. I'm going to actually try to dispatch a technician. I'm creating a work order for a blue pump maintenance. I'm saying, I want to do it between the hours of 9 to 12. And I want to do it today. I don't want to do it tomorrow. And I'm going to come in and say, you know, bearing or do something with the bearing. Right? So what I'm doing right now is I'm creating a work order. This work order is going to be created. And you saw the work order was created. That work order is now scheduled Jeff, who's my technician, to go out there. And we have determined that Jeff is the right guy based on the skills that he needs to go fix the pump, based on the closeness in terms of the location. He's the right person, available at the right time, to go and actually fix this particular issue. So I'm going to actually log in. And I'm going to try and log in as Jeff into the system and, and see what, what Jeff sees. So I'm now wearing my field technician hat. I'm no longer Lisa, in case you thought I was Lisa. <laughs> and I'm actually going in. And I'm on the field. And all I have is my iPad in front of me, right? And here is my field service ap ap application. And Jeff can see that I have three pending tasks in front of me that I need to do. Jeff can go into the map. 
And he can see where are the locations that he has to go to and what's the route that he has to take to go resolve this particular issue or the other issues that are on his plate. So Jeff can come in and say, okay, I'm ready to go. Let me activate my queue. I'm all set. I'm starting my work at the day. I'm actually going to go into that particular location and I want to do pump maintenance. Let me do a safety inspection. Has ever, is everything okay? Yes, everything is fine. Is the area clear? Yes. Is there anything? No. Is it safe from debris? Yes. Do I have any notes? No. I'm actually going to sign it. You know, I can sign it and I say submit it. So Jeff has now signed it. He's ready to go. Now, he sees the pump in front of him and he sees a device and he says, oops, I don't know what to do. I've been dispatched. I have to fix this, but I have no clue how to fix it. At that point, Jeff turns on and he, you know, he has glasses or he has augmented reality coming in and he turns on his augmented reality app and he tries to come in and see if he can figure out somebody who can help him resolve that particular issue. And what happens at that stage is now we are now jumping into augmented reality. So what this is going to do is actually going to show Jeff how the particular pump needs to be taken care of and what to do if I'm able to log in correctly. All right, there you go. So Jeff sees that in front of him is this bobcat. Now I can turn around and go through any location and you can see that, oh, I have this wonderful earth moving equipment called bobcat in front of me. Inside that there is a pump which I need to fix and I need to take care of. How am I going to do it? I have no clue where to look for inside this bobcat where the pump is. So he starts the experience and it says turn it on the side and there on the side you will see the pump located. Okay, got that. And what you will see in that case is what's the values that the pump is actually going to send in real time back to IoT cloud service. Now that I have that, what do I do with it? How do I take care of it? First step first, power off the pump, okay? Next, go remove these two on the side, all right? Go remove this pin on the side, okay? I can do that, I can remove the nuts, I can remove the faceplate, and that's where I've got to go in and replace that particular part. Once I have done that, I can put the whole thing back together and screw everything back in, put the pipes back in, turn the pump on, and I'm back to operational. So Jeff has now figured out how to do it. He does that particular activity. He has a live video in front of him, which shows him how to do it. And actually, you know, if I move around the device, you can see it from various angles. That's called virtual reality. So we are, we are using a partner product to get virtual reality embedded. But as Jeff, I've done my task, and I'm actually going in and saying, I'm going to finish my activity. When I complete my activity, that part is done, the work is completed, and I have now successfully resolved the particular issue. And I can go back in into, Lisa can go back in into her, the field service application, and she will see that the pump is now back operational. So that's what I had for the demo. Uh, we wanted to show you in real life how we have six, seven different cloud services from Oracle working together in harmony, coming in and resolving the issue on the field and saving money for the companies. So I think we're almost there from a time perspective. We can stay a bit longer if any of you have question in you know, one-on-one -on -one kind of fashion, but if there's any question for the group we can take now, well, very open to it. So we have time for one question, and then I'll let you ask questions afterwards. So, okay. If you want to hold on a minute, the gentleman in the front, I will bring the mic to you. So with the recent hack on Friday with the uh, IoT devices, how are you guys making sure in the industrial sense with all the actual things that if they fail, things really break? 
how are you guys making sure the security is up to, t up to par? Because with the hack that happened on Friday, a whole bunch of consumer devices were hacked and brought down a lot of the internet. How are you guys working to make sure that doesn't happen? So the IoT cloud service that we have is actually secure. I mean, what I did not show you, what I showed you was the end user experience. We showed you two experiences, one from Lisa, who is a service manager, and one from Jeff, who is a field service technician. But as I told you, behind the scenes, there are multiple cloud services that are working together to make it happen. And one of the, the key services is IoT cloud service. So the devices, when they are there, each device, this simulator and, and our physical device is actually to be registered in IoT cloud service with a secret shared service key that makes sure that only that device and that device alone can communicate with the IoT cloud service. So, you know, and, and that handshake is established. I mean, you know, we did, in fact, in, December, in, in April, we actually did uh, a physical device. We had, I wish we had that, a remote control car. You know, we were tracking the movement of, of a remote control car and, and driver behavior, tracking driver behavior and patterns and creating alerts based on, oh, you're accelerating too fast or you're, you know, you're, you're, you're braking too much. And you know what, you, we simulated an accident by actually putting our leg in front of the car and the car flipped over. You know, but, but my point was that particular device could not just communicate to any cloud service. I had to register that device with that particular MAC ID, that IP, with a shared service secret key to communicate to the IoT cloud service without which it won't work. The, one, one more thing on this one is like if you look at the the hacking that you see is usually on consumer devices. And consumer devices have a cost. They're trying to minimize the cost so that all of us can buy pretty easily. When you go to industrial devices, the level of security you see is absolutely amazing. If you take just your electric meter that you have at the outside of your building house, wherever you live, the chip is that they are using that is the um, is encrypted in a way that very, 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 very few people can even within the company can even decrypt that stuff. And it's actually encrypted at time of manufacturing and registered at time of manufacturing. So I cannot come up and bring a new chip and register on the cloud for my PG&E um, uh, grid um, cloud operations and, and hack that. Unless you find a way which is frankly, almost impossible today to hack in the chip itself. To hack in that chip, when we had an issue with the chip one day, and we brought it back to the manufacturing um, company who was doing the chip, themselves, to unpeel the chip, they needed a week with special equipment to be able to access the level of encryption that they needed to get to. A full week of work for one chip. And they have specialized equipment. They built it themselves. I mean, the level of encryption you see is a astonishing. The risk you'll see, and I, have, I, don't, I don't want to make it sound like everything's perfect, security will be an issue in IoT. We have to address it as an industry. In the, manufact in the industrial world, they've taken a step already to move in that direction big time. In the consumer world, frankly, it's not there yet. I mean, it's less about security because you, you, know, you usually don't have a lot of um, uh, private information or, or very... Um, Important for, it's more about privacy. I mean, if you use connected devices in the consumer world today, privacy is going to be an issue if you find ways to hack in the system. In the enterprise and industry world, it's in a pretty good shape already. It doesn't mean there's zero risk. There's always risk, but it's frankly, you have to, you have to go after it big time for a long time to be able to crack the code on the chip level. Encryption is at the cheap level. It's not in the cloud. It's not anywhere else at the cheap level. So it's very tough. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much.